You guys wanted to see a current real-world driving review of the Alfa Romeo Giulia and here it is, an exterior, interior and the driving experience on Autogo Fuel, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars today with Thomas. This one here is the Alfa Giulia Veloce. What is it? What kind of a version is it? We'll explain you and of course everything in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! Those LED daytime running lights are designed quite nicely. They also stress this horizontal way of design. However, the main headlamp unit starts with halogen, optional like this bike Senon. Sadly, no LED, no full LED option available for the headlamps and for a mid-size premium vehicle, that's surely something that is missing and a lot of people would actually go for. But design-wise, I mean, there's no doubt Alpha is really on the game there. Maybe we call this color dark Thomas blue, still a very nice one and the central Alfa Romeo grille right there in the middle, so beautiful. Well, you have the number plate there, a little bit displaced, in, but it adds some of the character. Of course, it's better when there's no number plate at all, then the car looks even more massive. And the Veloce is something between a base model and a Quadrifoglio, so already very sporty with all-wheel drive always and you can already see it in the front with a more aggressive bumper design. With 4 meters 64 or 15 foot 2, the Alfa Romeo Giulia is not a long car in the mid-size sedan segment, but for sure continues with this very tasty design in the side profile. Veloce badge is right there and a normal Giulia would start with 16 inch rims, then the Veloce gets 18 inch, but this one here is an optional dark 19 inch rim in a spectacular Alfa design. Overall round design shapes here you can find. This is here the dropping line dividing in light and shadow, very nice. Those door handles here, they also have an illumination and also serve as the keyless entry function. Close then here with a small button. You can get chrome elements around the windows, but the Veloce has more the sportier dark style and also has black window frames with this coupe style rear ending. And again, very nice nuances of colors when you have this muscular shoulder at the very rear part. I think this is really, you know, surely some art in automotive design, which Alfa has always been spot on. What do you think? In the rear you also have a horizontal stress. I like that the Giulia Veloce also does not go to the way of adding a separate spoiler. That would look weird a little bit but the rear end itself forms a little spoiler right there and I think that's beautifully done. Those exhaust tips, by the way, the real exhaust are inside. The outer ones are just tips, but I'm not sure. I mean, it's not this entirely fake as we see it um, you know, quite often. I think it's a clever way to integrate an exhaust tip for sure. Diesel version here today, by the way. Then this diffuser at the lower end in the middle part, so really has the sporty style already when maybe a quadrifolio is too much for you and you also want, you see the Q4 logo there, also want all-wheel drive for better everyday and winter capability of this vehicle. Engine-wise, ah, hydraulic struts keeps those ones open, pretty cool. So you have either a two-liter petrol engine with 200 or 280 horsepower the 281 would then also be the Veloce version with all-wheel drive and 5.2 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And then there's a 2.2 liter diesel here today with 150, 180 or 210 horsepower in the Veloce. Then again also combined again with the all-wheel drive and 6.4 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And then of course there's this 2.9 liter V6 engine with 510 horsepower for the Quadrifoglio. Mm. 
now to the interior and the inside of the doors. We also have soft touch on the top part here, soft touch material and also a solid build quality here with the optional Harman Kardon sound system. Pretty nice sound. Not any room for bigger bottles to stand upright there in the lower part. Then as I said earlier, this one here, the Veloce, whereas the base model also comes with fabric seats in Europe and the Super is available in the uh, fabric leatherette mix. The Veloce only comes with animal skin seats. Form-wise, those ones are also the sports seats. You can see they have thicker side bolsters. The base seats are actually enabling you to move around a little more freely. Those ones here, if you want it a little bit sportier and more like this caged-in sporty feeling. But of course, for a sporty version, they should also offer Fabric or Alcantara even for the Veloce or a nice leather red as on my belt. Here then the steering wheel, great sporty setup, nice design also, a little bit like the front grille and those huge shifting pedals right there, they're stationary. And how that one plays out, I will explain you in the driving review later. And now we come to the seating position, which is also, you know, according to the rest of the vehicle, very sporty. You sit quite low, not as low as in the quadrifolio version, of course. And also the close A-pillar right there. Good steering wheel handling, also the perfect size of it. At the same time, it's still a comfortable seating position, so you don't feel like getting lower back pain anytime soon. So I would also drive longer time with this vehicle, no problem. Um, there's small spotty to me from small things here and by the way even some other high premium vehicles do not have that this one here has a damper that doesn't fall down like this so um, some leaders they really got messed quite well as for the build quality I'm 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1 and we have the small glass roof equipped in here that reduces the headroom a little bit I still have you know enough room above my head but if you're a little bit taller than me, then you might get problems. So the steering wheel column can be adjusted. This has a wide reach, you see it here? Wow, so pretty cool to adjust that one here. And in this case, we also have electric seats and also with three memory buttons, you hold the button a little bit longer to save your current position. Here we go like this and the front part it's just you know for longer legs that one here is manual but that's also totally fine if you just control that one in a manual way next to that you have also two buttons right here which change the side bolster make it a little bit closer inward or make it a little bit more open they also have a very beautiful cockpit design here with this central line a little bit narrow right there and also this glass panel which looks very seamlessly integrated you either get a 6.5 screen or a 8.8 .8 inch screen like we see here this is the bigger one usually it would now with the newer vehicles also have apple carplay and android auto this car is not equipped with that yet but they say newer vehicles will have it and i also heard rumors of a software update so maybe stay in contact with your car dealer than for CarPlay and Android Auto. I think, again, a beautiful design, very clean also. Still, we have a separate climate unit. I like to have that still, just to control the you know, temperature in a very easy way, also while driving. Also, very solid build quality, USB port in the lower part, and we can slide open this front part. Also, have adaptive cup holders right there, automatic gearbox shifter, and then there's this turning, not for the driving modes, dynamic, also with harder suspension than automatically. Then the central part, you can control the infotainment system. By turn. This is a little bit loose, by the way, I think it should be a little bit fi more fixed. Then you just do it like this and then press uh, or go left and right. Um, yeah, this is not a touchscreen. It should be now already. For example, that they could offer both. They can do like this when you're you know, um, driving and 
touchscreen when you're stationary, for example. And the right side still a classic volume knob. A little bit strange is this middle console, which is pretty long, the middle armors, and it's, you know, sometimes takes some effort to release it. I mean, it's quite okay overall, but uh, when you want to close it, never put your fingers under it, because when you then really apply this pressure, you, you basically squish your own fingers. So never put your fingers below that, just put it on the top part, because usually they have a longer overlap and then you can close it like this when you have your fingers below it. It's no problem, but here it is a problem. From your perspective, again, this perfectly fitted steering wheel, good in size, volume con control on the right, left side for the ACC and the start stop engine button is here at the steering wheel directly instead of somewhere here. I mean, why not? Pretty cool view to this sporty gauges style also. Then the infotainment screen in close up, you can connect your phone via Bluetooth and as I said, soon also CarPlay and Android Auto will be available or maybe with a software upgrade later on. And the GPS, well, the visualization is really not good. You cannot see that well and it's also pretty slow overall. And um, if you then want to put in the address, it has this old system we also know from, um, for example, older BMW or Audi where you have to end it that way and it takes ages. At least when it's stationary, it would be cool if you also had the touch option, for example, or if I could ride inside this um, central control pad or something. I think that's not the best solution here. And as for the rear, remember this is a rather short car in the midsize segment and this is also rather the result. I do fit in here somehow as an adult, but you know, when the seat would be a little bit more upright or higher, my knees would also better fit in those gaps here at the backs of the seat, but here that way I cannot see it that well. So four tall adults after each other, not the best idea. Headroom wise, I also hit my head at the ceiling. There's another roof here, panoramic glass roof in the rear, but you can have this manual shape. I mean, why not? That's totally fine. So really not a very comfortable position here in the rear. Also the rear part here, this is more <laughs> laid out for design probably then for really sitting here. So, uh, and you have to flip the seats also from the trunk. You cannot do it from here. Isofix, however, here on the rear part for the child seats. And in the middle part, we also have separate vents and also a USB charger. Oh, and by the way, also soft touch here at the rear inside of the doors. Nice to see that still in some vehicles. Coming to the rear hatch, you can see the trunk is of course limited not only in filling in but also overall because the rear for design reasons is pretty slim and also it's not the longest car in the segment. Here see the cabin trolley, how it fits in there. It is okay for um, a mid-sized sedan somewhat but it surely doesn't win any room or flexibility prizes. Luckily when you have that option or it's also included in the Veloce as far as I know, you also have this flipping of the seat option then with a two-third, one-third split. But you can also, oh, where is that? There we go. <laughs> Here we go, we can load things through, but you can also just use the middle part right here, like this, as a ski hatch. Then you have just this one here. You can fill fold up this one. Here we go. So those are your options. And by the way, sorry it's in German, but if you're interested in the options list, I think most of that you can also read then uh, if you're not talking German, the, the options spec. Here's it with the extra prices when we total price amount of this vehicle. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge, the driving part of this review with the Alfa Giulia Veloce. As I said earlier today, we're driving the 2.2 liter diesel here with 210 horsepower, so a strong one. 6.4 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, and that's pretty fast. Of course, to me, to an Alfa Romeo, yeah, I think it should rather be in combination with the petrol engine sound-wise, because this diesel here, especially when you're in idle mode, just standing at a traffic, um, traffic light, it sounds still pretty much old-school diesel-like, this so-called diesel nailing, uh, that would be a direct translation, as we're saying to that in Germany. 
so you really hear that it's a diesel. However, acceleration-wise, you always got power reserves and a lot of torque. That's pretty cool, even if you are in a normal driving mode. In a normal driving mode, the suspension is also really soft. So very comfortable suspension, although we don't have too much body roll. So uh, they found a very good setup here. I already tested the base suspension of this vehicle, um, I think two years ago. And that already had a good setup. This one here today, because the car is equipped with the performance pack, comes with the adaptive suspension, which is again rather soft when you're in the normal driving mode, in the efficiency driving mode, same here. But when you're in a dynamic driving mode, not only the throttle input gets increased, that you can accelerate a little bit easier, also the steering changes a little bit, and the suspension gets a little bit stiffer so you have less body roll at the same time it gets a little bit rougher when you get over those bumps so for normal driving you just stay in a normal driving mode dynamic if you really want to have some fun and have some good roads and some good curvy roads you can have fun on then it increases you know the connection to the road so it's good to have the choice and so the adaptive suspension is no, not a must-have feature because the stand setup is already good, but it's a very nice feature to have for sure. So pretty cool. And you know, you really have a difference in those driving modes. Sometimes we don't have much difference between those driving modes. It really makes a difference here. As you've maybe already heard, at about 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour, and that is worldwide, a, let's say standard highway speed or something, the car was pretty loud. So also when you compare the other competitors in this segment, this one here is a very loud one. So that's a negative point. But in general, the driving is really probably the most positive point about this car. I mean, you, you've probably seen the reaction of the car just, you know, by this one curve. And we're going to the motorway soon, uh, soon once more. Now some, you know, city driving impression because what we're doing here are real-world reviews for real drivers, which is not always going to the Nürburgring Nordschleife, where this car performed very well, by the way, as a quadrifolio version, <laughs> um, almost beat anything. So, and I mean, it all also speaks for the car a little bit, of course, because the handling is really superb. The seating position is very sporty. You feel very much in control of the vehicle. It doesn't feel too big. Indeed, it is also among the smaller mid-size cars here in this in this segment. So it feels as it would be driving a very sporty car, and that's what it actually is. The steering itself is on the one hand super direct and just small controls here, small angle changes have a big effect. However, for some it might be too light and too artificial. In the dynamic driving mode, it you know it responds a little bit differently, it's a little bit stiffer than, but overall they did not manage to create a very natural feeling for the steering. So it is fun to steer, yes. It rather feels a little bit arcade alike, like in a computer game, where you would have you know not so much connection to the road itself via the steering. So I think they could, it's, it's a software thing for sure, so they, they could update it if they want to, but they choose to, to do it in that way. And I mean, when you're driving in the city and maybe fire, searching for a parking spot, something, it's also good that it's easy to steer. On the other hand, and I'll show you that when we drive faster a little bit again, when you're driving really fast and you don't have too much resistance here, so that it's not really adapting to the speed, it can be a little bit weird. So you're driving very fast and then make like this or something or, or this and suddenly like and you have an overreaction of the vehicle. So that's probably the thing about the steering here which I criticized most. But the overwhelming factor is really that the suspension is superb and that the car is great fun to drive and for sure to me among the most fun to drive in this very segment here. So um, 
the sporty design we presented you earlier from the exterior and also from the interior sitting here. You know, being as a driver, looking at those instruments, classic for Alfa Romeo that they you know, go very deep in there with, this, with those you know, um, round gauges style. So that's really sporty impression and the car does hold it, you know, hold, holds this promise. Also here as a diesel, of course, not sound-wise, but performance-wise, you're very well underway with the diesel here too. So, can complain about this acceleration figure and also the torque the diesel has, so you can also run it in a very calm way. Don't need to force the issue that much. The automatic gearbox is doing a good job, so hardly any shifting you would notice when you're in a normal driving mode and rather keep it smooth. However, if you are in the dynamic mode, then you get more of those shifting characteristics, which are then also, again, a little bit more noticeable. Mm, another thing I'm quite surprised of is this consumption and in a negative way, because I was tested it on a longer motorway run and I have consumption figures that should be rather fitting to petrol engines. So at the moment also, and also in the past runs, I had about 80 liters on 100 kilometers for diesel. And that is about 29 mpg. And for diesel, that's really bad. I hope that it drops down a little bit to, um, to something 7-ish liters or 34 mpg. I think that is possible if you really keep it slow and steady. Mm, you know, the official is just below 5 liters and 100 kilometers, the official figure, but you can never reach that. Keeping me updated here for sure. So, good look also at the digital speed there in the middle. We also have the blind spot monitor available, this yellow triangle in the side mirror. The AEB, the Autonomous Emergency Brake, especially for city situations, is standard equipment for all Alpha Julia. That's good. So they have a lot of standard equipment. Mm, sometimes they're a little bit higher in the price in comparison to the other market, to the other market competitors. But then again, they come with a little bit more equipment. I think that's, that's also quite good, good for the customer that more is actually included. So the blind spot monitor good because the windows are not that high. The B pillar is blocking basically almost all of your view. So it's good to have this blind spot monitor to be still able to you know, remain control. Now let's go to the dynamic mode and show you an acceleration of 70 kilometers an hour to 100 here with the 2.2 diesel. Oh, that's already it, wow. That's a very good acceleration and also felt very sporty indeed. So when you turn that diesel up, it also has a decent sound. It's more really the idle sound of the diesel, which is not that pleasant. You also have a uh, cruise control here in the adaptive trim. That's an option activated at the left side of the steering wheel. And then you set the speed at this jog here. And this is also doing a quite nice job, especially in comparison with the automatic gearbox makes sense. So you can keep the distance to the car in front of you. Here we go again also with the blind spot monitor. Those side mirrors are roundish. They look great, of course. They don't give you the best view to the sides and the side rear, so it's really good to have this blind spot monitor for sure. Here again on the motorway, a cozy feeling, but a racy feeling at the same time. So the suspension again has the great combination of offering you both. And I think you hear on the camera or on, on, on the microphone, better to say again, that I have to speak up a little bit against the wind noises. So um, I think that's something they should address a little bit more in maybe further facelift upgrades. It's not too bad though, but again, considering this car here is with all equipment optional, already 60,000 euros in Germany, I think it should perform a little bit better in that case. I mean, good that we also can measure this vehicle against all the other high premium competitors because, you know, in, in a lot of ways they've done a good job here for that too. And this, oh, this is so lovely 
when you're a little bit higher speed and you're in the next corner and you feel so much in control of that vehicle. I wish I had a little, a little bit more natural feeling of the steering wheel, then it would be perfect, but already without it, now we're in this roundabout, but I don't need to steer that much. Perfect control. Wow, really cool. And it does not push over the front tires at all. With all wheel drive here still remains with a rear wheel bias. So you're still very sporty. At the same time, you have more safety, for example, in the winter times when you don't have all the power on the rear wheels. Wow, so great to handle and so nice to drive. So the all-wheel drive is for sure a good choice for this vehicle. Otherwise, it could become a little bit sketchy. In this performance pack, by the way, we also have the limited slip differential for the rear. Mm, I mean, in dry conditions here and when I'm not racing the car, it won't play such a big role. But actually, I, you know, I read some customer comments and they said it would be very helpful in winter times for this vehicle here. Um, might not be the case for sure here for the all-wheel drive version, for the Q4 versions, because you have the all-wheel drive anyway then for winter times, but especially if you would not have the all-wheel drive version of this vehicle, then maybe the limited slip differential makes sense um, because, you know, in, in winter times when you have all the power on the rear wheels, it reduces the slip, you know, in, in, in both directions basically, and then it's maybe also a little bit safer, so that's, I think, an interesting aspect. You know, about this shifting pedals here at the steering wheel, mm, I mean, they look amazing, as I said earlier, very well crafted, they also feel, look um, very pricey, <laughs> but they're also pretty large, so, mm, great clicking start, that's fun, click, click, I mean, really fun to control those, click, gear up, Another gear, but I can't see anything by the way through the B pillar, so it's not possible really. So get those blind spot monitors. So shifting down, by the way, you can also stay in normal driving mode and then use the downshift with the shifting pedals here. They're again pretty cool to use on the one hand, but then, for example, when you have been using them or when you have used the turning indicator column or the wipers, and then maybe your hand is not directly close to the steering wheel, but you have it like, you have your hand like opened a little bit, you know, that your fingers are a little bit spread. And you may be in the corner, and then those shifting pedals here, they remain at the same place. And then it can really be that you hurt your hand, you know, push your fingers against those shifting pedals. That would not be the case if they are, in, like in, in many other vehicles, if they are directly mounted at the steering wheel because they move together with the steering wheel. There are also maybe factors that play for this one here. Um, you know, the whole FCA group is doing it that, that, way, that way, basically. But I'm more a fan of those that are connected to the steering wheel. I think for the everyday driving customer, for the normal car customer, I think it's the most clever choice. So you might argue maybe as a racer that this one is maybe better, I don't know. But as I said, for the normal car customer, I guess it's easier and less hurtful <laughs> if you place them directly at the steering wheel. They're by, by the way also part of the performance package. So um, you can also get the Alpha Juliet completely without them if that would be, you know, a, an annoying factor for you, that's also possible. So now a little bit of countryside road and... I mean, you have to watch out that you don't get caught by the police or some people thinking like, is that guy drunk because he's doing like slalom lines all the time, but this car really seduces you saying like, come on, do another slalom, it's so much fun. Why don't you? <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm testing it on the roads, and last time I did it in the States, someone was writing like, oh, you, you would surely have gotten the ticket when the police was uh, would be noticing that. And yes, I mean, there's always a danger of, of that, because they could probably say, 
you know, that it's a dangerous way to drive or maybe a attracting public anger, I, I don't know, but, um, you know, I just take the chances in, in some of our test rides here to do some, you know, like little slaloms without, um, you know, without being dangerous in, in any way, at least to me. Um, I just needed to test the car and see how it performs here and it's really lovely how it reacts suspension-wise and also how much you stay in control of this vehicle. and. Overall driving-wise, this Julia here introduced a whole new generation of Alfa Romeo. But at the same time, they remain true to their core values. It means this great design, of course, and you also feel that when driving it a little bit. It, it sounds strange, but maybe some of the car enthusiasts know what I mean, that you feel the exterior of a vehicle when you drive it. Some might say, ah, you know, that's pathetic. I somehow do. <laughs> Maybe you do too. Then of course you'll see the interior, also the sport interior. Then you have those typical imperfections of an Alfa Romeo. So some things you say like, oh, come on, why haven't they done it like in this or that way? Why can't it be easier to use a GPS, for example? Why can't it be a touchscreen now, especially when I'm when I'm standing still? Why have I hurt my fingers on the middle console again? Uh, like small stuff like this. But then again, you get rewarded by the driving, which is really uh, so much fun. And then there's only the high price remaining. That directly leads us over to the conclusion. And now to our conclusion for today with the Alfa Romeo Giulia Veloce. It is indeed a good compromise between the base model and the quadrifolio, which would be maybe too powerful for some, especially in everyday road use and also too expensive. However, it's still somewhat expensive because, you know, if you look at the base model, then uh, here, this one, 45, 47 at least. And when you put more equipment in it, now today this has to be, as I said, 60,000 euros as a German price. That's already close to the Quadifolio then, so I think it's still a little bit too expensive. But also the other mid-sized sedans are also very expensive. In general, the exterior really delicious for this vehicle. That's what Alfa can do, what they have done also for the past decades. Of course, also with a, let's say, dark Thomas blue color. <laughs> and the interior also likable as for the design, for sure. The build quality is a massive improvement if you consider past Alfa Romeos, that's for sure. Here and there, they could still use some tweaking infotainment system software-wise, especially in some of the knobs. Um, the room they have available is also not best, but it's also not a very big car for the mid-size segment. And the driving experience is really cool. We had a lot of fun, for sure. The steering is a little bit light. It needs some more feeling, some more resistance, especially in the progression when you drive a little bit faster then. But still, it has a great handling. The suspension is also acting very nicely between sporty and comfort. Just when we have you know, some rather fierce bumps on the road, then it gets through and doesn't master that in a very well way. But for sure, one of the most fun cars in the segment. Consumption here for the diesel was very high. I could get it down to seven liters and one kilometers, which would be 34 MPG. However, still too high for a diesel in this very segment. I guess then you can go for the petrol engine anyway. Won't make such a difference then anymore. So what do you think? Looking forward to your feedback now about the Alfa Giulia Veloce and also tune in to the next Autogefühl episode.